Hello, everybody. Wasn't that awesome? I just want to, I'm just blown away so far. Thank you for all of our experts coming. Um, thank you, patients, families, everyone. Um, I did want to highlight a resource, this QR code right here. Um, scan it. That is a patient resource toolbox. So in that toolbox, we have the glossary, the expanded glossary. We have a link to, to register for the CORDS registry. We have a link for all stripes. We have the conference, the schedule. You're wondering what the schedule is, like the details, that's up to date. It's all right there, our website. Um, all, of our play, all of our things in one place. I just wanted to highlight that. Um, okay. I'm Allison Peck. Um, I'm a co-founder of Cure BCP Disease. I'm Nathan's wife. Um, and I'm going to give a little intro to our natural history section. Okay. This is the way I helped me process the rare disease chasm. On one side, we have the medical community. And they say, we need data. We need patient samples. <laughs> we, need, we need publications and we need funding. And those are all true. On the patient side, we say we need treatments. We need cures. We need support and we need expert medical care. So in the middle, how do you connect the medical community, the researchers, with the patients? That's where patient advocacy comes together. So that, that, help, that helped me process all of this, all in one little simple slide. OK, what is natural? We've talked about it so much. So, so this is kind of a little question. Is it? the patient registry? Is it medical records? Is it functional measures? Is it clinical assessments by a neurologist? Is it novel approaches like video measures, um, cell phone monitoring, iPhone apps? Is it biomarker discovery? The answer is, is all of the above. Okay. So Nathan touched on this slide before. What are the current partnerships that Cure VCP has right now? The CORDS registry. This is, was our first step. We are at 90-something patients. We want to get to 100. We actually wanted to get to 100 three years ago. <laughs> We're not there yet. So if you are a patient, been diagnosed with VCP disease, and you're not in our registry, it takes 20 minutes. Can done, be done remotely. Use that QR code, click it, um, fill it out, and do it every year. Because if you do it every year, it becomes a natural history study that only takes you, yeah. You just, yeah, so you, you just have to click on that link and fill it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it is a lot of questions, but it's a lot of very important questions. We have the All Stripes medical collection. It also only takes you, uh, the hardest part is remember what doctors you went to. It's one form, one time, and then you're done. We also have, we're with Nationwide. We are... I forget the current number right now. It might be 35. We originally only thought we could get 20. We are at 30-something patients. This is amazing. Um, but we'll hear more about that later. And then we have Casimir. We're at 20. This is fabulous. This is running these two in parallel. We'll hear more about it later. Um, is going to really, they're really going to complement each other. Um, because we, we don't have a special presentation on our registry, I did want to put, put up this slide. 
Um, it's the we're part of Chords. It's the largest um, database, free database in the world, international. Um, it's totally IRB controlled. Um, this is just the power, the patient voice from the registry. I'm just to, showing two metrics. One of them, this is quality of life. This is a way for us from our home to easily say, how is this disease affecting us? The question is, um, uh, does, is about fatigue. 76% of our patients report that they often or always feel tired. And then 45% of our patients report that they are often or always affected by pain. So th that's individually, is it, is it a symptom of the disease? I don't know. But a large part of our population says, yeah. So this kind of preliminary voice helps direct future research. And this is just a little slide about um, all stripes. They actually, I'll send this um, insights out to y'all before, but based on a survey, they um, surveyed and just as the whole diagnostic odyssey. So, so with, with that, that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tassin Mosafar. Um, he's from UCI. He's a neurologist who specializes in neuromuscular centers, and he uh, directs nationally recognized UCI Health, um, ALS, and Neuromuscular Center. Thank you. And he's one of our medical advisors. Thank you. Thank you, Allison, and thank you for, <clears throat> for allowing me to come and <clears throat> not only meet you guys, um, but also uh, sort of organize this uh, blood collection. So I'm going to talk about natural history study, and I, I think um, Allison did a great job of setting up the what natural history studies are and, and to acknowledge that Nationwide is doing some of this stuff. And I think of, and I think Lindsay agrees with me, that um, that's mainly a, a pilot's effort which will inform how we design a larger study, and, and she's going to be very much a part of it um, as a co-PI, as actually one of the PIs on that study. Um, so I hope I ho don't have the same problems that Armel was having. Um, so the, the re, uh, I can't read this. Okay. maybe I should move. Um, so what natural history, as Allison said, it's, it's an observational study. So observational means that there is not going to be any intervention in it. We're not giving any drugs. We're not doing any intervention that will change the outcome of the study. Um, and the purpose here, and the reason we are doing this, is you guys heard a lot about there are potential drugs that can, that can treat this disease. There are potential drugs or genetic interventions that can treat this disease or cure the disease. But we are not going to be able to do any of that study unless we know what the natural behavior of the disease is. Okay? And in a disease where there are so many different ways the disease can manifest, we really need to understand how the disease progresses, what the different phenotypes or behaviors are, and are there factors that influence transition to, from one particular type to another type. So why do some patients present with muscle disease and all of a sudden develop ALS? Can we monitor that? Can we predict that? Can we control that? In that sense? So <clears throat> natural history study is a longitudinal study where patients are seen on regular intervals. It could be six months. It could be one year. Depending on how fast the disease is progressing, if it's a very fast-progressing disease, you can even do three-month visits and get that information out there. Among that. It does require multiple visits, and we can talk about whether seeing them in person is the right way to do it, whether doing it virtually is the right way of doing it. Um, and, and I think a combination of the two will be excellent because there are certain things you can not do in a virtual visit that may be able to do it in an in-person visit. For instance, drawing blood on them is not going to be possible to do it. You have to have a separate visit by a phlebotomist, et cetera, on that. Um, <clears throat> you do detailed clinical and functional assessments. You want to assess their degree of disability, and that's what you're going to measure in terms of progression. Okay, um, and then if you want to do things like imaging, if you want to do things like muscle biopsy or skin biopsy, then obviously it has to be in person. 
But a lot, I mean, there are different models. I mean, the University of Miami did a beautiful study on a very fast and aggressive form of familial ALS where they, the investigators actually went out to patients' home because they were so disabled that they couldn't go to a clinical center. So, the, so Dr. Benatar sent his nurse practitioner, and he himself sometimes flew out to patients' home and collected all this. So there, there are multiple ways you can do it, and a, a lot of fields are thinking about this. ALS has been working a lot on it, including home assessment of pulmonary function testing, et cetera. So there are, there are different models that we can adopt. And I said, nothing is, is set in stone. We are still thinking of how to best design this study. So the, the advantage is you get a very accurate assessment of the, nat of the disease phenotype because you're actually physically examining patients, you're assessing them on that. You get an accurate estimate of disease progression. You understand the factors that influence disease uh, behavior, disease change in behavior um, on that. Um, and then you, it gives you an opportunity to validate and assess the surrogate markers, and surrogate markers being the biomarkers. So these could be biological specimens, blood or, or urine or whatever you have. It could be imaging biomarkers like MRI or CT scan or PET scan. It can be um, something called electro, uh, electrical impedance myography, which looks at the resistance in your muscle, um, and, and that's something that's being used a lot in muscle disorders, as well as, well as in ALA on that. Um, so we, we, the questions that we are trying to answer is, is there, is the disease progresses in a uniform fashion, uh, or does it, it, it is completely random and we don't we know what that random is. So what's the mean rate of decline, okay? So you take 50 patients or 60 patients, and then you should be able to get a mean or a median value, which is the same as an average, <clears throat> because that's what's gonna allow you to determine uh, intervention studies. Um, do different muscles behave differently? So there are diseases where the quadriceps may be spared, the quadriceps may behave differently than the biceps. So we want to know which muscles get affected more, which muscles get affected less, so Megan and Lindsay can focus on those as a primary outcome rather than wasting their time on unnecessary muscle assessment that are of no value on that. Uh, <clears throat> what's the best measure? Is IBM FRS the best measure, or actually doing a quantitative muscle testing the best measure, or do we look at other factors like proximal muscle strength, so time, get up, and go? Six-minute test, six-minute walk test was always the favorite in neuromuscular, and it's going out of fashion, and partly due to the work of the nationwide group, we've shown that it's not as sensitive in IBM, inclusion body myositis, clearly not as effective, there are better measures. And I think that same thing will happen with other diseases like Pompe. Um, in the, in the uh, muscular dystrophy field, we are using something called North Star Ambulatory Assessment. Um, that's turning out to be a good measure for some of the other adult onset limb girdle muscular dystrophy. So there may be an opportunity there as well um, on that. Uh, <clears throat> and then we really want to know which one is the most reliable measure and then what the rate of decline is because that will allow us to estimate how fast or slow the disease is progression, and more importantly, how many patients would we need to run a therapeutic trial, okay? Because patient sample size calculation is the most thing, okay? You want to be able to get away with the least amount of patients in the shortest possible time because you can't afford and no industry partner will ever afford a three-year study um, because they don't have the patients for it, they don't want to invest that kind of a capital in it. So if you can do a study in 12 months or maximum 18 months, that's the best way of doing it, and you want to do it with the least amount of patient, but yet get quality data. Okay, you want to see an 80% effect on that. So <clears throat> the other challenge is this is disease, unlike inclusion body myositis, which is where we already are doing a natural history study, this is a complicated disease because the patients, one, manifest in different forms, but within patients, you can have a change of phenotype. So they may have, I mean, the, one of the first patients I saw with VCP was a young lady who had a myopathy, had a familial myopathy, was doing fine, I mean, slowly progressing over 10 years, and all of a sudden crashed and burned. Okay, and Dr. Kimonas emailed me and says, what's going on? And I said, this can't be IBM, this can be the IBM, she must have developed ALS. And we didn't know 
that VCP patients could develop ALS at that time. She was one of our first patients that actually truly manifested as ALS um, on that. And now we know that it's account, VCP accounts for about 2% of familial ALS. So that's not an uncommon presentation on that. Uh, but you can have a neuropathy, you can have frontotemporal dementia, and generally when you develop frontotemporal dementia, disease accelerates. So that's the other factor that you have to come in. Um, and then Paget's disease, which generally doesn't affect the disease progression, but we want to understand the factors. And more importantly, in a longitudinal study, we want to know if you can predict upfront who's at risk for developing it. So there are markers like, I mean, I was talking to Chris Wild this morning, so there's something called neurofilament light chain, which they've been measuring it in some VCP patient, and it may be a predictor of ALS. We know that in ALS, NFL levels are high. So let's say if you have a myopathy patient who has high, high levels of NFL, does that mean that they're going to develop ALS? And that's something that we don't know for sure yet, but that's the kind of study that we want to do on that. So. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. That's why Melanie and Anne-Marie are here, because we need samples. Samples are precious. I know Nationwide has few samples, um, not, I mean, some samples. I mean, Chris has um, uh, uh, some samples. And we are going to share. This is, these are not exclusive samples. I mean, we, we made the IRB in a way that we will interchange um, our thing. But we, we really want to look at, if are there good, reliable blood markers? So TDP43, especially the the phosphorylated version of TDB43 may be a good useful tool in blood because generally we do it in muscle, generally we do it in CSF, but we sh can we do it in blood uh, and show that it's predictor? As I mentioned, neurofilament light chain is an, another important one that we want to explore. And then metabolomics and lipidomics, which require fancy equipment, but we have the capability. We're already doing that in Alzheimer's and we're doing that in Down syndrome. That may be another opportunity to look at that, um, on that. And that's one of the reasons why we're getting information from you on how, when did you last eat, because those numbers can change because of your diet and stuff like that. Um, we want to know what's the best outcome measure, which is the work that um, Meg, uh, Megan and, and um, Linda and, and Lindsay are doing. We, of all the different permutation, which one is the most sensitive on that? I know Linda, uh, Lindsay doesn't like composite measure, but there may be a role for composite measure as well um, on that. Uh, um, and, 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 and which is the most sensitive to change. And then one of the things that we have done in the past, and before we write a big grant like this, we get the community input. We get the, the patient and caretaker's input. And, um, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So this is what we are looking for. This is hypothetical. So let's say we have a patient who has VCP myopathy, okay? So we want to know what's happening with the leg strength. We want to know what's happening with the overall functional rating scale, the IBM-FRS. And if the swallowing may be involved, we want to know what's happening with their swallowing time. And the expectation is that there will be a linear decline in all of these functions as time progresses, okay? And that time progression could be months. The time progression could be years. And as in ALS, we know some patients are slow progressors, some patients are fast progressors, okay? So we want to be able to determine that as well because your therapeutic intervention may have to be stratified based on the rate of progression. So in ALS, for instance, when we do analysis, we take into factor whether they were fast progressors or slow progressors, okay? But, <clears throat> and, and what we want to hope to show is that, let's say if you take IBM FRS as an example, and there is a linear decline, and you have a trend that goes like this, can we change the trend to the positive? Can we slow down the rate of decline? Can we stabilize the rate of decline? Um, and that's what we are really hoping for, a difference between untreated and treated, okay? In neurological disorders, most of the time we are hoping for stabilization. I wish I could use the word cure, but if I can stop the disease in its track right now, that is a major win, okay? And that's what we want to know. But life is a little bit more complicated because if along the way they develop ALS or some other complication, the disease trajectory would change drastically. And we've seen this a few times with our patients who 
had IBM uh, uh, myopathy, but also developed ALS along the way. And this is the kind of information that we would need from our natural history study. How often does this happen? What the rate of change is if they happen to have another complication versus just pure IBM um, on that? And that's the kind of information that doesn't exist right now. Okay? And before we spend millions of dollars on a therapeutic intervention, all of this information is important. Okay. So what, uh, with, at least with inclusion body myositis, which is a parallel disease, what we did was we um, organized something called a community engagement studio where we got about 12 patients with IBM and their caregivers, put them in a room. There was an independent moderator. She was the former dean of our nursing school. And we had some very structured questions, but then we also do, uh, asked their input. And we get, got valuable information. I mean, the patient brought up issues that we had never thought about, sleep disturbances, pain, um, sexual um, dysfunction, things like that. So it gives us an opportunity to tailor our, fund, um, our grant. We want to, so we included um, questions about sleep. We included questions about pain as part of that input. And the reviewers of the grant really loved it. I mean, they, they, all three of the reviewers highlighted this particular aspect of the grant, and we want to do something like this with the VCP patient. I've already asked um, Allison and Nathan that whether our group can do it. We have a group that's dedicated to doing this kind of work, and they can do it virtually. It doesn't have to be in person on that. The other thing we did was we surveyed um, patients in US as well as in Australia with inclusion body myositis, their attitudes toward a non-interventional study. So would they be willing to participate for two years in a study that doesn't necessarily provide any direct benefit, okay? Which may require frequent visits, that may require them to take time off work, that may even involve muscle biopsies and into invasive procedures. And we were very surprised that most patients were willing to do anything possible to help the cause, okay? And I, I'm sure the same is true for his VCP, but again, that's something that we can very quickly arrange and do a survey through Google Forms or something and get that information, because all of that will help our cause in terms of that. So what, um, and then in terms of the biomarker, what are the good biomarkers? Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, muscle, uh, and what specifically in muscle MRI? So we can look at fat signals in the muscle. We can look at signals of inflammation in the muscle um, and that. Um, in electrical impedance myography, usually is a linear change. We can look at it. It's a very predictable, reliable thing. I mentioned already blood markers and lipidomics, but you can also do transcriptomics. The technology is really fantastic right now. You can do RNA sequencing at a very deep level and understand the genetic permutations that are going on. You can do it in blood. You can compare it to, to needle muscle biopsies. We don't need to do an open biopsy. There are needles that don't even, um, you don't have, even have to cut into the skin. You can go through the skin, get a nice piece of muscle, almost painless, but it gives us a lot of information. So we are exploring the, whether we should include muscle biopsies in there and that. So um, the challenge would be recruiting. The challenge would be how do we get these patients to a site that can do all of these um, uh, assessments. And some of the assessments could be amenable to remote assessments, and I think the work that Nationwide did and the work that is being done um, uh, through Casimir is gonna inform us as well uh, on that. But some of the assessments may have to be in person, and, and then travel is always gonna be a challenge. These patients are spread throughout the US. So one of the things that we can do is take advantage of the network that we have already set up for our inclusion body myositis natural history study that is already funded through the NIH, which has 13 sites all over the US, very strategically chosen. Um, so we have pretty much most of the regions covered. Um, and Florida was the latest one that we added, so we now even have the Southwest, Southeast covered as well. Um, so you can send the patients or funnel the patients to one of these sites where the physical therapists have already been trained and, and, and we'll make sure that they get trained specifically for this uh, thing. But that's one suggestion. We, we may choose other models as well on that. So based on that, <clears throat> what we have proposed, uh, what, what we are proposing, and this is again a work in progress, we're hoping to submit by February. Um, so we will really um, go into 
uh, action in October or so to finalize the grant. But we had, it's a collaborative multi-center study. We have nationwide participating, we have UCI, we have Newcastle's um, participating from England um, on that. There are multiple investors that are com investigators that are coming together. They all have their own expertise, and they will be responsible for their segment of the grant. So it's a multi-PI grant, as we call it. Um, it's it's going to be a hybrid design. There's going to be multiple sites in the U.S. Um, we hope the patients can be sent there maybe once a year for in-person visit rather than every six months on that. Um, and these are the specific aims. The first aim is to establish the natural history. The second is, aim is to, to validate the different biomarkers, and we can choose any uh, combination of markers, and I would really love to have a muscle biopsy in there as well. And the third is the work that Lindsay is doing, and take it even further, in a larger group of patients to validate what's the most sensitive and best outcome measure for therapeutic trials of the future. On that. Um, and this is generally, this is our IBM uh, schedule, but this is similar to what's going to happen here where we see these patients every six months um, and get five time points. Five time points are better than three time points. We can do it yearly, and we can see you once a year, and so baseline one year and two years, but that's three points. And if you miss one time point, you get bad data. So if you do five time points, that's actually better than three time points, and that's how it was designed originally. <clears throat> on that. But one of the things that will come out of it, and that, that's what's already happening in our IBM study, is that you get a large repository of very standardized clinical information, but also a very rich biospecimen repository, where we're collecting DNA, we're collecting RNA, we're collecting, in the case of IBM FRS, we had, uh, IBM, we're collecting bio, um, uh, PBMCs. All of these will be stored, all of this will be available for secondary analysis, so if we get another grant down the road, we can look at it again. If somebody has a grant and want to have access to this sample, we share it with them on that. So this is gonna be a resource that's available to the scientific community in general. I can tell you just from the IBM grad, we've submitted two additional um, grants this, just this past week that will allow us to do additional analysis on the plan, things that we plan. And at the end of the study, all of this data goes into public domain. That's an NIH requirement. So this will be available for future use as well. On that. So this is where we stand, and I said, um, I think the real push will come in October. So before October, we would like to have the patient engagement. We'd like to have a survey. We really are planning for a February um, submission. Um, that I would estimate we probably will need anywhere between 70 to 80 patients to, be, to be, do a meaningful study. That's a large number, but that's, that's how we need multiple sites, et cetera, and, and the support of Cure VCP is going to be incredibly important to do something like this. So I'm happy to take any questions, any comments, any criticism. Yeah. That. We've got, I got can a, handle it. We've got a couple minutes uh, for Q&A, so probably like two questions. Okay. Yeah. Quick question. The uh, study uh, site in Florida, is that at the University of Miami Medical Center with Dr. Benatar? Yes, ma'am. I'm already in a study down there with him. Will he be able to use the same information or? So I, I don't know that particular study, but I, I, I'm sh the, the challenge with any new study is that some of this uh, um, information has to be fresh. Okay, well, I'll go see him next month, no problem. Thank you. Nathan? I just wanted to make a comment. Um, you know, back in 2019 at the NIH, you came to DC while we were there exhibiting and we were talking about this. And so, um, it's awesome. I mean, it, it's coming, and I hope everybody understands that we're going to, again, I'm going to beat my drum. We need your participation. 70 to 80, three years ago, I would have thought, yeah, no problem. Holy smokes, people. That's, that's a lot. So, but yes, I, you know, back to that first meeting at the NIH, I mean, we've talked about this, right? And you asked for our help to help drive this, and so here we are. No, and, and I really appreciate that. And, and again, it's going to be a team effort. It's not going to be one person doing it. I can tell you also the grant mechanism takes a long time. My grant that finally funded took five attempts and three years to get funded. And, and it, every time it came back, the reviewers had new comments that we incorporated, and it, it came out to be a better grant than that. So it's, there's no guarantee that it's going to get funded in the first go. Okay? But we want to have as perfect of a grant in the first submission so it gets funded. 
for that. And and it's going to be a way more money than the seventy five thousand that Armel talked about. Okay, um, these grants are usually in the millions because you have multiple sites on that. So I wish I could tell you that I can run a natural history study on eighty patients for seventy five k. It's not going to happen. I just wanted, I just wanted to redirect. This patient community can do it. I mean, look what we've done so far. It's going to take everybody, but we can do it. 